Last Thursday, when we met for dinner, we could celebrate the birthday of a close friend of uh, the three of you, Bob Dylan. Where is it Bob Dylan comes in, in terms of the counterculture? Why this huge impact of this one single man on the counterculture? You're the biographer, well, your like friend. I mean, we can all we can speak all, yeah, of it. I mean, I mean, for me, it was everything. A girl, as a girl, I was just wanted him to be my boyfriend. You know, he had like a special magnetism, and he kept evolving like Picasso. You know, it was like every record he 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 went into a new shift. He kept evolving. We evolved with him. I mean, he was like. All the things we were thinking about, he he seemed to say the way we really wanted to dress. It was like it seemed like everything he did was right where we wanted to be. Even you know, if there were 20 pairs of sunglasses, he picked the right ones. He had the right <coughs> shirt. He had the right way of walking. But and all his idea, you know, he gave us protest music. He gave us you know social awareness. He gave us you know. You know, sexuality. He gave, gave us love love songs. He um, he never, you know, he just seemed everything you'd want. Like if you had Arthur and Bo suddenly living in your time, you know, it was like <coughs> that's that's what he was like to me. All the people that I loved in the past, because I lived so much in the past. Finally, one of these guys was living in my time. One of these guys was alive, writing poetry, and and and. Um, and uh, giving of himself while we're alive. I could finally like a guy that wasn't dead. You know, so. <laughs> I, I think what I learned from him, you know, I, I was pretty top 40 and listening to rhythm and blues and doo-wop, but what he taught me was that about the sound of his voice, that he had such a strange and bizarre voice that it expanded my idea of what a voice could be. That once I got used to how he phrased and the timbre of his voice and the things he was saying and his sense of humor, you know, talking World War III blues, it really gave a sense of expansion. And then he kept going. You know, uh, I mean, I wanted to be a lonely folk singer in the backyard when I got my first guitar. And, you know, a year later, especially after the English invasion, and, you know, every folky was, you know, this is the end of, of you know, music, you know, oh my God, you know, these bands from England. And I was That's completely legal. charmed. Yeah. And, uh, and all of a sudden, here's a folky who was pretty resolute who said, yeah, I'm going to plug in. And all of a sudden, these, these universes came together. And, uh, you know, lyrically, I mean, he, he took, he, he made lyrics into a whole nother animal, even beyond what the folkies were doing, and uh, created a sound that, you know, I certainly changed my life. Well, I think the sound is there, but um, a good friend of you guys, and I know him a bit well, Harry Smith, who was important to the whole folk movement, once said that he knew that God existed when he heard Bob Dylan on the radio. <laughs> it's a very Harry way of thinking things. But, but, but yes, and there was a sense that things were opening up that you could not hear anywhere else. And you know, I mean, Dylan starts out on, on the folk scene, and you know, there's a lot of folk singers, and it was a movement. And Joan Baez had a beautiful voice, and Joan Baez had a lot to do with making Bob Dylan popular. And there were lots of other folk singers around. Um, and, and, and he was one of them, and he was a good one of them. But then he sits down and, and writes a song like A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And that's, that's of a whole different order poetically. I mean, when that album came out, I remember that album coming out. And, and, and that song split my mind open in a way that few other things have ever, have ever done. I mean, the cover of that album was great, too, because he was walking with Susie Rodolo, his girlfriend, and, you know, that was so hip. I mean, you know, I, wa I wanted his girlfriend but, 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 to be my girlfriend. But what was, what was so important about, about that song? Why, why? Because Ellen Ginsberg also said something like, when he heard the song, I knew, you know, that the torch has been passed to the next generation. That's true. What? Well, first of all, there was just the imagery. This, 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 you know, uh, the imagery itself, 
I mean, just listen to the song, any, any one of them. Um, drums are blazing, uh, branches that are bleeding. I mean, he once said that he was trying to write, you know, it's like every line in that song is like the first line of another song. <laughs> You know that that and and and, and it's all it's all pulled together and it's and it's a song it's a song of of complete bleakness and of terror and of apocalypse that ends with redemption and ends with you know with with uh, with prophecy and I think that's what Alan saw in it but I you and I, I didn't I don't know if I I didn't I even figured out at the time all I knew were there were these words that were saying things that I'd never heard said before in a popular musical vein. And, and, it, and, and it was part of the democratization, I think you're talking about opening it up. I mean, Dylan made, made that stuff accessible in ways that other people couldn't. He, made, he brought poetry to the masses because, yes. I mean, for me, listening to it, I mean, I had read Season in Hell, I had read Illumination, so I could see that he was, you know, Hard Rain is Gonna Fall made total sense to me because it's very Rimbaudian. Yes. You know, there's certain lines that are almost right out of Rimbaud. And, uh, but he, you know, I was reading Rimbaud, and probably in South Jersey, it, there was probably one copy of Illuminations, and I had it, you know. But, um, but then suddenly he is writing these songs that brings this, you know, because he cherished Rimbaud as well, brings all of his knowledge of poetry, all of uh, his um, ability to um, synthesize all of his things that were having politically, social injustice, his love of poetry. You know, he was, a, he was our alchemist. He put all of these things together and created songs that, even though they were elevated, were still accessible. And, um, you know, so I, I think that was, you know, he, he gave us in one song, that particular song, the state of the world, pollution, you know, in, injustice, you know, all the things that, you know, crimes against children, all of these things in one song, as well as giving us uh, poetry. And, uh, you know, so, so everything was like, you know, it was almost subconsciously we were getting quite an education through one song. But then as Patty said too, I mean, he, and, and Lenny, he kept moving. I mean, he was a year ahead of everybody at one point. And, and that's why the people were getting so upset, in part. But, but he, kept, he kept, like Picasso, there are, artists have different kinds of forms, and there are people who have periods who keep moving. And he never stopped. He still hasn't stopped. He's still doing it. And it's why I love him so much. So that's part of it as well. You know, he was, he, we were having to, he, he, he gave a, um, he taught us a great deal, but then as soon as we caught on, he was somewhere else. And we were having to catch up with that too. And that I was, was waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs>